Hey everyone, I'm Matthew Sheffield. Thanks for joining me for another live Theory of Change broadcast. Uh, we've got another interesting show here for you. And um, I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, Theory of Change is available in both audio and video, uh, but the video version is the live version. Um, but uh, after we're done, the full transcript of the audio will be available at flux.community. And Flux is a new uh, media organization for podcasters and writers. Um, and we're trying to build a community of people who are producing in independent content and bringing um, an extra, uh, bringing out stories and voices that are not heard in the conventional media. So the address of that is flux.community. So please do check that out. Um, and without further ado, um, I will get into the topic today. All right. <clears throat> Misinformation, incorrect beliefs about the world, and disinformation, deliberately constructed falsehoods, have always been a part of human history. But they are playing an increasingly important role in politics around the globe now, especially after the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Research is showing that people on the political right and people who are inclined toward religious traditionalism are more likely to believe falsehoods about science and the world. What does that mean about the future? Likely related to this is that the emergence of Donald Trump as a Republican political figure seems to have accelerated a pre-existing trend of more educated people away from the GOP and less educated people away from the Democrats. Joining us to discuss all this today is Will Wilkinson. He's the publisher of Model Citizen. It's a newsletter about politics, economics, and philosophy. Will is also a former libertarian who once worked at the Cato Institute, where he was the managing editor of the magazine Cato Unbound. So thanks for being here today, Will. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, so um, let's, uh, b before we get into the larger topic, let's uh, give people uh, who aren't familiar with your work a little bit more of a background on, on yourself. Uh, so one thing um, that you and I have in common is that we both come out of the, we were both uh, born into the more, uh, LDS Mormon movement, although in your case, you were from one part of that and I was from another part. Um, so uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, pe some people have heard of the, you know, the larger uh, uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but there is another tradition that uh, is based in Missouri, and that's the one that you were a part of for a while. Tell us a that's little right. bit about that. <clears throat> so, what What was the main dividing line there be between them originally? Uh, well, you know, I grew up in the what was at the time called the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They've uh, they've changed their name to the Community of Christ um, some you know decade ago, I guess now. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but they're headquartered in Independence, Missouri, which is where I was born. Um, Independence is, uh, according to Mormon tradition, the place where um, Christ is going to return. Uh, and uh, it's near the Garden of Edom. Uh, what is that? A Adam on the Amen? Is that what that's mm -hmm. called? Yeah. Um, yeah. So so there's a lot of uh, you know, fun Mormon facts there. Um, but, uh, you know, like it was the church that I was raised in, it's much smaller than the uh, Mormon church based in Utah that everyone um, knows and loves. Uh, I was in college, a tour guide at the Joseph Smith Historic Center in Nauvoo, uh, which was one of the first big Mormon settlements in the West before. And that's Illinois. Yeah, in Nauvoo, right. Illinois. It's on the just uh right on the Mississippi River, uh, on the Illinois side, Iowa is just on the other side. And uh, the big split between those two, you know, denominations occurred after Joseph Smith was murdered by a mob uh, in a jail in Carthage, Missouri. Um, oh, Illinois, this, actually. Carthage, Illinois. <laughs> um, it's been uh, a while, I guess, huh, Will? <laughs> yeah, uh, is it? yeah. Um, yeah, he, he was he was trying to escape. Um, 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 uh, well, he'd been put in jail because he had uh, instructed a kind of kangaroo court mob to uh, smash the presses of a uh, uh, of a newspaper 
kind of an independent newspaper in Nauvoo called the Nauvoo Expositor, I think it was, and uh, and caused a big foo-foo-ra. Uh, they were basically reporting things that were true. This gets to the disinformation stuff, I guess, because yeah, Joseph Smith was an oddly Trumpian character. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and he was very, very mad about the fact that they were saying true things about uh, kind of emerging doctrines about... Um, kind of a multiplicity of deities and and polygamy uh, also and, and 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 yeah plural marriage and and so he had their presses smashed but that got him in trouble with the state and he fled uh and so it was a big uh, a big mess um but the 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 letter he wrote to the governor is a sight to behold you'll notice all of the kind of like um grandiose victimization that um we've all become familiar with after four years of uh, the donald trump presidency but anyway he got murdered and then um you know it's a prophetic religion um where you know there's an ongoing process of um of of revelation um and so god is speaking to us uh still today and so like but it was speaking through Joseph Smith, who who takes up the mantle now as the conduit for you know messages from God. Um, and so there was a kind of a split on that, and the the big divide was between the kind of anti polygamist faction and the pro polygamist faction. Um, the anti polygamist faction was kind of was the smaller <laughs> one, <laughs> a much smaller one, um, and also just in you know demographic terms is, is not going to grow as fast. Um, but, uh, you know, Emma Smith, who was uh, Joseph Smith's first wife, um, you know, she and her children kind of anchored the anti-polygamist faction. Um, I guess it's probably no mystery why Joseph Smith's um, first wife would not be super cool into polygamy when that wasn't the terms of their deal <laughs> to start with. Um, and uh, yeah, and so Joseph Smith, um, Joseph Smith's son, Joseph Smith III, took over the mantle, and uh, you know, after a little bit of time, and uh, and so the kind of Midwest Mormons who didn't leave to go to Utah reorganized, and that's where the name came from. Um, but it was always a much smaller denomination and developed in a in a different direction because it didn't start with you know. Polygamy was out from the beginning. It didn't have the same set of like of uh, of there were some of the later Joseph Smith's later theological innovations um, mm -hmm. um, about you know you know every male member of the Melchizedek priesthood becoming um, the sort of god of their own universe that got left out. Um, a lot of the temple ceremonies got left out. Um, there's no tradition of having um, a temple that's kind of closed off uh, where you do yeah. rituals. Um, so it's really, it really developed in a quite different direction and developed in a very kind of liberal kind of. Well, and it was also, direction. yeah. And I, I think it's also fair to say that it was uh, the, the RLDS and not just art, but there were some other, you know, groups it was much, much smaller that, that remained in Missouri as well or Illinois. Yeah. Um it was they they were traditions that were much less anti-american than you know lds mormonism ended up being especially in the very beginning mm -hmm. um so like for instance in the uh the mormon the, the lds mormon temple ceremony for a long time they had members uh swear uh they they had members pray for the for the destruction of the united states actually for a long time <laughs> yeah uh, i uh, mean like they were illegal uh, they were they were in fact persecuted by the state. Um, they were you know first before they went, went to Illinois they were run out of Missouri. They first went to Jackson County, Missouri, which is where Independence is um, when I was born. Uh, they enough of them had moved there to you know shift the political balance um, mm -hmm. so that they had enough heft that they could elect their people um, to you know kind of these mayor roles or sheriff's roles and things like that. And that really threatened the kind of incumbent settlers uh, who didn't want to be governed by what, who they saw as just like wackadoodle cultists. Um, and 
like a little civil war happened. There's like literally like a shooting war with uh, people in Missouri and the Mormons kind of got routed and they ended up moving back east over the um, Mississippi River. So they had this sense of very in, um, uh, aggrieved combativeness that, that like that they were, um, you know, beset by all sides. Um, when, when he was killed, Joseph Smith was running for president. Um, just something not a lot of people appreciate. And in, in a very kind of like populist kind of way, um, he's, he, he, he's, I think, really an underappreciated character in American history, partly because like his legacy is kind of like very tightly protected by the Mormon church. So you don't get the, um, as, um, and, like, I just think he's like a fascinating person and he's just like a kind of a rollicking character and, you know, it just makes stuff up all the time and people believe it. And it's amazing. Uh, yeah. Well, and, and that's very, the, to go to, to what you're saying, that's one of the very Trumpian aspects <laughs> of, of uh, Joseph Smith. Um, yeah. He's got this amazing ability to just like freelance, just like, like just this kind of improvisational skill where you just kind of drive yourself into a corner. Um, and, you know, you're never planning more than like two steps ahead. And, but like somehow you always figure out a way to like, you know, what spin to give people so that they're going to like give you an exit. And sometimes you can even make like a, a victory out of like talking yourself into a, like, it's just, it really is an amazing set of skills. Like watching Trump for years, you're just like, every time you're like, oh boy, he's in trouble now. And then he's just like, whoop, you're like, nope. Uh, and like people think that guy was dumb, which is just baffles me. The guy's clearly a, some kind of like genius, not like, you know, he's not going to be doing like high level math, but in terms of like seeing the angles in a strategic situation and kind of knowing how to get people on his side, knowing how to um, discredit and delegitimize any source of information that mm -hmm. is contrary, like, like he's so effective at those things. And you just can't be if, unless you're um, have a certain kind of brilliant oh, quick wit. Yeah. And I, and I feel like people still underestimate him, like, which is why, like, he's so dangerous. He's like so underestimated, um, despite the fact that the dude just like lied his way into the presidency of the United States. Um, and, and, and so anyway, but like, to Joseph Smith, I, you, once you like have seen Trump and then you go back and read Joseph Smith stuff, you, you could, it, like the, the parallels are really, really interesting. It's a similar mm -hmm. kind of charisma. It's just like, you know, you just imagine if, Trump decided that having his own religion was the way to go. Um, well, it's tax free. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, and uh, Although you know, apparently and he, Trump are... found a, the other way to avoid taxes, which is have big business losses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you're like, you know, yeah. You buy a bunch of properties, claim that they're not worth crap when you're paying your uh, property taxes. But then, uh, <laughs> but then on the other side of it, uh, you have, you're like, when you're applying for a line of credit, then they're worth twice as much as you claimed when, uh, you know, you were uh, doing your taxes. And yeah, it's a it's a incredibly effective scam. Yeah. And yeah, illegal. But um, yeah. And the reason, you know, be, be beyond just the sort of uh, the, the similarities between Joseph Smith as a person and Donald Trump as a person, um, there's also the aspect of Mormon theology that um, is interesting to the current discussions about disinformation is that, you know, Mormon theology is built on the idea that, uh, on the Book of Mormon, um, and believing that Native Americans uh, are actually the descendants of ancient Israelis. Um, and, you know, and, and, and that's something, of course, that there is no evidence that's been proven of that at all. And, you know, people, when they have scientists have sequenced the DNA of literally tens of thousands of people now, um, Native Americans, and needless to say, there are not any Jewish Indians out there. <laughs> um, and it looks uh, like they came over the land bridge from Asia. Yeah, yeah. Like, and just like the, that, and that was, that's what people had theorized that, you know, this was a population that came over from Asia and then DNA basically confirmed that. Um, and, but it's interesting when you look at the way that the community of Christ uh, has dealt with the modern 
uh, revelations, well, scientific revelations, that is, of the fact that, you know, Native Americans are not the descendants of uh, Jewish Indians. Um, whereas, you know, and then you contrast that with the way that the LDS Mormons have looked at it. Um, I mean, there you, it's, in, in many ways, this was kind of a, a precursor to a lot of this, this, the debates over fake, you know, fake news, as Trump calls it, um, and actual fake news. Um, do, you, do you think there's any parallels there? Well, yeah, I mean, like... Well, actually, that, maybe tell us about what the RLDS slash Community of Christ uh, evolution on Book of Mormon historicity was. Like, how did that come about? Well, it, as you it evolved in, I mean, it evolved in a basically like a bunch of the higher up members of the priesthood in the community of Christ um, ended up going to regular seminaries like uh, and just got the kind of liberal take on the historicity of scripture. Like there's, you know, this idea in sort of like liberal theology. Like if you go to like a divinity school in a mainstream university that isn't, you know, like, some kind of like fundamentalist Christian school, uh, you, you know, you get this view that like, yeah, yeah. I mean, some of this happened, some of this didn't happen. Um, but like the value in a religious tradition doesn't come from the literalness of the scripture. It's, you know, contains all of this wisdom, all of this direction for life. Um, you can be rooted in this tradition in a way that informs your life spiritually, blah, blah, blah. And, and it's, and, and it's just, it kind of detaches itself from claims of the, you know, facticity and just accuracy of revelation and scripture, because, you know, it's really kind of crazy when you think about it. Um, and so, uh, and so, and that's kind of the way that Re organized church community of Christ ended up going. Well, like it's willing to acknowledge that the book of Mormon isn't the literal truth about um, the, peopling of the new world uh it like but considers that sort of like a little bit beside the point that you know like there's uh there's that you know like people can be like inspired in a way that uh that connects with something higher that we don't have to take as literal transmission of the contents of god's mind to you right like there's this higher power and it can, you know, we can connect to it and bring it forth and communicate something about it um, creatively by doing things like creating poetry or new scriptures, I guess. Um, and so it's kind of like, you know, a, a, a liberal Episcopalian version of Mormonism at this point where, you know, it's like, you don't really need to believe it um, to, you know, you don't need to believe that the Book of Mormon is literally true to uh, still, you know, be to a find value of, from it. Yeah, yeah, yeah or to, to get value from it, or to 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 have faith in the lessons of your faith tradition, or whatever you want to call it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and and you know, and there's always been these divisions within that denomination, like any denomination, like, and it's always playing itself out. There's always a more conservative faction and a more liberal faction. The same is true. And the, you know, LDS church, there's, you know, always kind of like liberal reformers and they're always resisted by kind of conservatives who want to maintain the status quo. Um, and it's just in the case of the RLDS, the kind of like liberal reformers kind of kept winning the argument, yeah. the internal politics. So, for instance, like in the mid 80s, um, um, was still the RLDS church. Then, you know, my mother was in the first cohort of women to be brought into the priesthood. Um, and you know, that's something that hasn't happened in, uh, the, uh, LDS church, even though there's a lot of women who've, you know, pushed for it. Um, so like, uh, so they just developed in, in, in different directions, but, but like the, these disputes over, like, like, I think there's a real direct connection between, uh, kind of religion, um, 
revelatory traditions and the kind of like epistemology of disinformation because like mm-hmm. once you get into the business of faith like things just become about trust right th- th- like there's no one is out there saying that like okay if you just follow up on these three things you'll be able to confirm empirically that the book of mormon is true or you'll be able to confirm empirically that that like um, you know, Adam and Eve uh, were actually in this garden and there was actually a snake, you know, like, like, like nobody's really saying that, 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 that there's a way of confirming this through rational empirical analysis. Um, it's about faith and uh, faith is in the end about trust in the people who conveyed who told you the story of that tradition who told to you, you the story yeah who told you the story in the first place it's that you're trusting that they are telling you something true um and they got it from somebody who they're trusting uh told them something true um and so you've got kind of like a it's like an epistemological pyramid scheme where there's no foundation and nobody really claims that there's a foundation um it's just all held up by this these networks of kind of mutual trust and uh and and like and i think it piggybacks off of like real dynamics in the world um we create social facts all the time just by agreeing to them um you know i'm married and and being married is is like a you know it's not a physical fact it's not an empirical fact it's a social fact that's codified into law but it means something really real because other people recognize it the law recognizes it but it's um you know ontologically just based in convention and social agreement um you know the the value of a dollar or your money you know like fiat currency is you know like a a collective dream like we all agree that it's going to be worth something and that's what makes it worth something yeah well um, even I, I mean yeah even yeah. honestly gold itself you know be, the gold standard people like to say that oh well this is a real thing well the, the reality is that gold isn't a very good metal <laughs> um and it's you know and and it's not even uh you know there's other like platinum is better uh as a metal in turn it's rarer and, and to say nothing of all the other, you know, much more rare, uh, rare earth minerals out there. So like the fact that gold is worth, you know, as much as it is, that is a convention also even. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think, I mean, and that's actually one of the genius things about human nature. We're cultural beings, like we inherit culture from each other. We are able to learn which is something very few animals can do, right? So we can, you know, like I know how to do algebra and like, how, how, like why? And it says somebody else figured it out and I was able to pick it up and we can do that like over and over again. Like I, you know, have a decent tennis backhand and, and we, we're just like this incredibly mimetic, imitative beings that like are constantly downloading culture and that's like our best adaptation it's why we like live in houses and have you know roads and cars and bridges and the internet and stuff like that um it's because we can accumulate and transmit knowledge over generations uh and 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 it's and it's very powerful but part of that is is um just like tied into that is is the way we develop conventions and norms and pass them along to each other. And some of the norms that we develop are, um, we, we ground them in a, a set of conventional beliefs that it's really indifferent and it's really irrelevant if they're true or not. What matters is that people treat them as true. And when they treat them as true, they become a real effective force in the way society gets structured in the way that people live their lives. Um, And, and I think that human dynamic is easily exploited um, where you can, um, because we have to have, we have to trust other people um, because our main adaptation as a species is just like downloading facts and skills from other people. Our parents, our teachers, um, like that's all trust. I mean, like I, 
like I can tell you some facts about Saturn, but I've never seen Saturn, right? Like I'm just trusting that the, you know, that the, the you know, astronomers know what they're doing, that like the earth world really isn't flat or whatever. It's just like, um, most of what I know is testimony based on testimony. It's nothing that I've ever independently validated. Um, and, and so it's just, we have to, we have to be that way. It's a special set of skills that very few people have to like figure out um, who to trust when there are disagreements and that, you know, if, if you're going to get past just, okay, this is my team. This is what we say. That's that team. That's what they say. Um, if you're like, well, you know what? My team might've been wrong. You know, like, like I remember growing up as a kid, in the RLDS church, which had, you know, like a quarter of a million members in it. So it's tiny even compared to the, you know, um, you know, the Utah Mormon church and just thinking, geez, I mean, whew, like, like how lucky am I that I just like landed in like the one correct religion, but it's tiny. I mean, like, what are the odds? They're very, very low. I'm like, wow, dodged a bullet. Cause I easily could have been like, you know, Hindu or something. Um, but like I lucked out and landed in the right set of beliefs and, you know, you get a little older and you realize, Oh, maybe, maybe the fact that it is incredibly improbable isn't evidence of my good fortune. <laughs> um, yeah. but evidence that maybe like I should look into, um, whether, uh, cause everybody else thinks the same thing. Right. Uh, and, 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 and so once you get past that kind of like, I trust what the people who raised me say, then you're in this huge quandary. Like, how do I learn how to figure out who to trust? Um, because you don't really have anything else to go on. You're not going to, on your own steam, figure out the facts about global warming, Right. You're just not, you'd like, you, you're not going to take the surface temperature of the ocean. Like somebody else is going to do it. Um, but you don't know that they're not lying to you or you don't know that it's like conservatives, you know, say that like, oh, they're, they're, it's, it's a bunch of science that's made up to support a policy position. And if you trust the people that say that, it makes sense. Right. I think you're on mute. Uh, yeah, no, that's that's a good point. And I think the it's uh, and, and this is a struggle that, you know, the American right basically has has been in since its very beginning. So uh, like you could argue that the really the first sort of national co proto coalescing of conservative political identity began in opposition to to the theory of evolution and Charles Darwin. Um, so like, and it was a struggle that played out in Protestant seminaries first as a political struggle where they were, you know, basically they were angry that, you know, a number of historically Protestant universities like Harvard or Princeton, uh, or, you know, Yale um, had it began accepting that evolution was something that happened and also had then also at the same time had been accepting a non-literal interpretation of the Bible. And they saw these two things as being linked. Um, and so there began to be this, you know, this uh, big organizing against, um, you know, uh, in favor of a fundamentalist uh, organizing in seminaries. And they succeeded in some, in some of them. So like they took over the Princeton Theological Seminary in the 1940s. Um, and, you know, but this is all, and, 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 and they kind of, but they didn't succeed ultimately in the larger scale of things at, at pushing forward a, a literalist biblical interpretation of science, of biology and, and mm -hmm. geology. Um, and that kind of, it was something that kind of, you know, ate at a lot of fundamentalist Christian Americans um, for a long time. And um, then you had the emergence of the New Deal, which came, you know, shortly after the the Soviet Revolution in Russia, and so a lot of people, you know, they saw 
uh, in their mind, this you know atheist revolution, sweeping governance, sweeping religion, sweep you know just everything coming out there, and and that that's sort of the context that American conservatism began in um, as sort of a protest movement against all these things that they saw, and and they saw them as you know sort of. Um, and depending on who you were talking to, like some of them literally saw this as, you know, Satan's work. Um, Satan was doing this and making all these people work together. And that's something that you don't really hear a lot about in the history of the early uh, conservative Republican world. No, right? that, that, that's fascinating. Like, so where, when, where do you locate kind of the beginning of conservatism in, in the sense that there's a line from... The conservative movement today the republican party its origin goes back to you know like where do you see the critical point because like when you know like it's not like you know like the politics of like the 1880s or something like there's always like a more liberal and a more conservative faction but like it doesn't seem to be like politics didn't seem to be organized around the same set of terms yeah um and like and like and so I'm, I'm myself like vague on this. I have some vague idea about um, politics kind of taking the shape and the basic alignment that it has today. Um, like, like the industrial revolution is a super important thing. You start to get like a certain kind of capital labor dynamics that you didn't have before. Then you get to, um, um, and then like the, and, and that leads to, the socialist revolutions of the teens and like at that point like i feel like the advent of organized communism the russian revolution this kind of materialist atheistic doctrine that is a real thing in the world um and 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 the way that then that gets reacted to in places that don't want to go down that path by, you know, kind of softening the socialist doctrine, doing things like the new deal and things like that, where, and and, and happens in a lot of Western European countries where um, they're like, well, we're going to have a revolution unless we start to, you know, redistribute some money, make sure that everybody gets a fair deal. Right. Like, and so, so. In well, some and that's what the original con uh, conservatives that that's how they saw what they were doing was conservative to construct a welfare state. Um, yeah. To, to ward off revolution. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so like, yeah, the kind you know, like tankies these days will still see like, you know, the, the German welfare state, which is one of the first big ones as like fundamentally conservative because it's there to make enough concessions that workers don't revolt. Um, yeah. and that kind of tamps down revolutionary energies and keeps the exploitative structure of capitalism in place. Um, but like, like obviously today's conservatives don't see, um, the, you know, kind of Western and Northern European welfare states as in those terms. fundamentally conservative projects, right? They see those as soft versions of socialism, which in some sense they are, um, like, and they can be both, right? They can be conservative in the sense that they're trying to hold on to an overall capitalist structure without going all the way down the sort of communist road. They're conservative in that sense. Um, and they're soft socialist in the sense that they're adopting enough of the socialist program to do that work of maintaining um, the overall status quo without the kind of revolutionary change. Um, and so like, for me, that's where, I, that's where I, I start to see what I recognize as the politics of the 20th and 21st century is the reaction against um, the rise of communism and the rise of um, big redistributive welfare states that, yeah, that, that, well, that, and, that, that's where I, where I start to feel it. Um, yeah. But, well, but and, I think and, you're right the, to, to mm -hmm. point something out about the, uh, the reaction to more generally to the, uh, the naturalizing worldview that starts to enter with Darwin, which is a real you know threat to religion. Yeah. Well, and it was, it's also important, I think around that, you know, in the 1920s, 19 teens, um, you had, you know, in the United States, especially um, one of the biggest selling books of the 1920s in the United States was this book called Looking backward, and it was by this guy named Edward Bellamy, who was a Christian socialist. Um, and 
I, oh, I'm actually getting an echo on your end there. For, I'm hearing myself from your audio there all of a sudden. Okay, yeah, hopefully that's better. Uh, all right, can you still hear him? Okay, good. Um, yeah, and so so the, the Edward Bellamy, you know, socialist Christianity, that tradition basically was canceled by, you know, um, the, the more economically conservative um, Christianity, which basically said, you know, you are, you're, you are enabling atheist Darwinism, um, communist, you know, Karl Marx was, was an atheist, he hated God, and communism is about destroying God. Um, and that was, so basically, once that idea emerged, um, and it was it was something that took a little bit to kind of coalesce, but that was basically the nucleus of American conservatism right there, which is that not only do we oppose socialism for economic reasons because we have all the money, uh, um, but also because that's an, an ungodly system. Um, and so, but, you know, but in that mix, though, there also was an influential to the emergence on the economic side was uh, was, you know, were these early libertarians um, who not just, they, they were opposed to a lot of the emerging consensus in economics of, of you know, some of the ideas of John Maynard Keynes and other people like him. Um, and, but they, they didn't have data to oppose it. Um, and so they began to attack the idea of, of you know, knowing economic Verity, and like knowing, being able to understand things about the world that you couldn't do it through experimentation. You couldn't even know it through data. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'm like, so, I mean, one, one of the big roots of the kind of American free market movement, the libertarian movement, uh, you know, comes out of a reaction to socialist economics and to kind of Keynesian um, views of macroeconomic management, right? Like both of which claim to be scientific in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, you know, so, you know, there's this whole debate, the socialist calculation debate, which like, you know, is about like, is socialism even possible? Like the, what, you know, what communists want to do? Like, how do you know um, how many shoes to produce in your five-year plan? Like, how do you know, uh, like how much apple production you need, you know, like without a system of price signals, without like this mechanism of discovery. These are all very, very good points. They're good. They, they're they're uh, um, basically everybody agrees that um, the critics kind of won that kind of debate. But some of the, um, and, you know, and, the, you know, the early, the, the clearest exponent of the, or the clearest, earliest clearest critic of ideas about socialist calculation that you could centrally plan an economy from the top down was uh, Ludwig von Mises, uh, 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 an Austrian um, economist uh, who's, who's born in, I guess, what's Ukraine now, um, but uh, developed a very you know, kind of powerful theory about the logic of economic action that is more or less a priori that doesn't really require empirical facts so he, and he called this field praxeology um and uh and you know and it's based in which is funny because it was like, a socialist phrase <laughs> pra what? praxis praxis was a marxist term actually originally yeah uh, which kind of co-ops it a little bit it's, it's a bit of a troll i think yeah um, but yeah, and, and then, he, you know, and he bases this, you know, very kind of deductive kind of view of the necessity of relatively unregulated capitalist systems from a set of premises that he claims are more or less self-evident. And what Mises term is apodictic, um, which I don't think is a word that anybody uses. Uh, and, 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 you know, this view still persists a lot. Like the kind of Ron Paul kind of people are Misians. They 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 think that there's an argument for the why capitalism works that doesn't depend on um, getting your hands dirty looking through empirical data about you know. So, what but what, what, 
walk us through the logic though behind this idea of why don't you need data and empirical knowledge uh, according to this idea um it's well i mean it's a really it's a really kind of like in a lot of ways it's not that different from the way like conventional economics starts it just starts with these really strong rational choice assumptions that um that people are uh, rationally self-interested, they are going to have the motivation to discover the information that they need to satisfy their ends. And, and then there's a lot of, there's a lot of steps that add up to, um, kind of proofs of market efficiency, where if you have all of these people who are rationally pursuing their individual ends, uh, gathering the information that they need to satisfy their needs, and and they're in a system where um, they can freely exchange, where the prices of goods can reflect um, the supply and demand in the system. Then it's going to sort of like necessarily turn out that um, that supply and demand are going to match in the right sort of way. Um, everything that people need provided is going to get provided um in the most efficient terms that you can you know that are you know kind of physically feasible um and a lot of subsequent economic thinking uh, you know was about how that kind of thing breaks down in the con you know in conditions of you know, too much market concentration or um asymmetric information you know where some people know you know like i can sell you something that's busted if you don't know uh, and, uh, you know, like, you know, you, you can get away with kind of like wholesale fraud for a long time, as long as you can conceal information from other parties, uh, and just, um, public goods problems, like why well, you, or market shocks. Uh, yeah. Well. Uh, you can get these, you know, like you can get bubbles and, you know, the economic systems can kind of collapse in on themselves. There's a whole list of things that, you know, contemporary economics is built on and, and the thing is like it's built on the experience of these crises right like a lot of modern economics is based on um the experience of the great depression right like what happened like 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 how did everything just kind of collapse um like how why was certain kinds of stimulative economic policy you know all this redistribution all these public works programs um all this kind of monetary and fiscal stimulus why did that actually kind of seem to work to um bail out the system you know like that's that's what a lot of modern economics is about um but that the kind of Miesian austrian tradition is like that stuff is all irrelevant right like I, I, and they always lean on just really strong counterfactual reasoning there's there's because there's always you know the world is complex and so you can always say that, like, well, if the state hadn't done this or intervened in this way, um, things would have worked out. Um, you can always say that, right? Like you can always say that like oh, the system, the system is like in principle efficient. It's just like the state interventions are preventing the market from equilibrating. It's preventing people from um, spotting entrepreneurial opportunities because like it's not allowing them to, you know, like there's, yeah. there's a lot of reasons that you can cite for why the market seems like it didn't work in the way that your ideology says that it works. Um, and so in that sense, it's a, it's like a, you know, it's a unfalsifiable. It becomes this self insulating set of well, and Yeah. And it's very convenient <laughs> because basically they never have to pr provide any, you know, evidence that their ideas work. Um, and, you know, and, and, and it wasn't originally directly linked to the, you know, the supply side theory of economics, which is basically like a, a lobotomized version of Keynesianism. Um, and so, but it, so, which is funny though, because basically, you know, over the decades, they essentially did get linked in terms of the practitioners, uh, you know, like the people who believe in the, in and admire von Mises, also, generally speaking, seem to believe in a lot of the supply side shibboleths that, you know, like if you cut taxes, you will always have revenue even increases, even though supply side theory doesn't actually say that 
it just it says that there is a point after which if you cut taxes you will get less revenue um, but they always they leave always leave that part off <laughs> um, but yeah and so like they basically though it would it, it ended up as sort of a an economic uh, version of anti-epistemology in the same way that the fundamentalist Christians were saying that well we can't prove that you know the Bible isn't literally true we can't prove that uh, but we know that it's true uh, and then the question was always well how do you know that well I have I feel that it is uh, and you know and that and that's basically ultimately the same argument <laughs> of of Misian uh, economics in a lot of ways and and you know and so as just as it sort of began, you know, eventually uh, allying with and coalescing with the supply side theory, it also actually began uh, merging with the fundamentalist Christian um, theology and anti-epistemology. So like you do have now a lot of the most prominent uh, in the United States, most prominent Mises exponents are also fundamentalist Christian. So like uh, this guy named Gary North, uh, is you know very big in libertarian ultra libertarian circles and this guy's you know straight up a uh, young earth creationist um and he writes about both things all the time um yeah. you know like i one thing i, I want i want to say like ludwig von Mises is a great he is a great thinker and a great liberal thinker um like he's in a certain kind of a priori a priori you know kind of kantian Germanic tradition, which is very rationalist. You can kind of spin things out in your head, like Kant is, you know, spinning out in his head the, you know, the 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 preconditions for any experience at all. Like, like, you know, like you're just thinking it through rationally. Um, and 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 like, you know, it's not claiming to be based in faith at all. It's claiming to be based in like the power of you know, the human rational faculty to um, to be able to recognize and work through the logic of the empirical world. Um, and like the the idea that you can figure it out a priori is based on these kind of Kantian ideas that in fact, the empirical world is structured by our own sort of conceptual categories that because the the world is organized by the structure of human consciousness, then you can figure out the way the world is by working through that logic in your own yeah. mind. Um, and, 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 and like the problem there is the, is the kind of Kantian assumptions about the structure of the world being uh, a function of our categories of understanding rather than something that's completely independent of our consciousness um and so like that like if you, you you know if you you know so that's where i'm gonna like part ways in the first place with somebody like mises like i think like the, the project depends on a view of the efficacy of reason to delineate how far the structure of the world go. that yeah. that is just like not going to be right because the structure of the world uh isn't determined by reason right like so um yeah. it's it's just it's just this brute thing that's outside of us that is puzzling and we have some faculties that we can use to try to figure it out um but they're all fallible and 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 the only thing that's like math is math uh <laughs> and so you can't treat anything that's you know has to do with the way things actually work in the empirical world uh like you treat math because um it's it's weirder than math um and so like math can you know, help you understand it, but like you can't, you're not going to be able to understand, um, you know, human exchange and the emergence of giant economies by thinking it through from first principles in the way that you do a logical proof. It's just not going it, to, it's just not going to work. Um, and so, and, and so like in that sense, like, you know, like it's really a rationalist tradition that's like super different from the kind of like fundamentally religious epistemology. Um, but like, I, I, I think you're right that it, they, 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 they end up intersecting um, because, you know, it's two different reasons for um, 
minimizing the importance of empirical oh, observation. Yeah. Um, and, and so, and so like, if you're already committed to that, um, because you're a devout, faithful, religious believer who thinks that like, you know, evolution can't possibly be true because like the Bible said that we were created in six days and, or whatever, you know, like, and like that the, yeah, the tower and, of Babel story was real. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so like that, so if you're already committed to the idea that, that, that the results of empirical scientific inquiry uh, have to be wrong because they conflict with the thing you already believe on faith, um, then you're going to find some other system that says that empirical inquiry is irrelevant, attractive. Um, and, and, and you might even th like, like the idea that it seems super rational um, because that can like make you feel like, you know, these, you know, like these sciencey people are always claiming that I'm like not rational because like, uh, I just believe this stuff on, on faith, but like, no, I'm super rational because like, I love like working things out from first principles in a deductively valid way. That's what rationality is. Uh, and so, you know, it, I feel like they kind of can be mutually supporting, even though at that philosophical level, they're in, um, they're in yeah. their intention. I'm like, you just don't get there if you're just like, let's see what works. You know, like, like you don't get to, you don't get to either the religious position. You know, it's it's just funny, just like as an empirical observation, just like how few people arrive at. A religious conviction through independent intellectual inquiry it's just like almost you know if you're religious the odds are overwhelming that your religion is something that you inherited from your parents or is something that you came to believe because you became embedded in social networks with other people who believe that right like and that's the main reason people convert is just like you're not Mormon, um, you're you're isolated and lonely, and some Mormon missionaries come to your house and they convince you to come to the uh, come to the ward for a service, and you have all these welcoming people, and you're like, oh, there's this community that's ready made here for me. They actually want to help me get a job. Um, they and like me, <laughs> yeah, they like me. They're so nice, and you start coming, and these people become your friends, and then you're like, I think there's a lot to what everybody here thinks. Right. Like, yeah. and that's why people convert. They just get drawn into a new social network. Um, and so like, either it's just like something you got from your parents or you became embedded in the new social network. Um, and like, you don't see it. You don't see it. Like somebody's just like, I want to have the correct religion. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm going to do this like exhaustive survey of the religions of the world and see which seems most credible Logical. according to independent intellectual standards. You know, I'm sure there are a handful of people who think that they've gone through that process. Um, but even people who like kind of act like they're going through that process, it's like they always end up at something that is um, uh, like they don't end up with something that's just like puts them at complete odds with the communities in which they're embedded. Yeah, it, like doesn't happen. Um, yeah. Well, now in your own case, though, um... So I guess, yeah, you know, one, yeah, another thing you and I have in common is that, you know, we both, so we both started off in various versions of Mormonism and also on the political right. Um, and we both eventually moved away from that uh, for, for various reasons. So um, talk about your own process and how did that happen for you? Um, um, well, I mean, long, it, I, I'm sure that's a long answer, so... <laughs> I mean, like uh, the but... quick answer is like I was, um, I was a tour guide at the Joseph Smith Historic Center, giving tours of Joseph Smith's house in Nauvoo, and I was told in advance that I was going to have to just sit in this visitor center a long time, like waiting for people to come for tours. You know, it's mostly Mormons from the West coming to on these little pilgrimages to see Nauvoo. And so I just like brought the biggest book that I had in my house, which was Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. <laughs> and I sat there in the visitor center and read uh, Atlas Shrugged. And by the end of it, I was like, I don't believe in God. Uh, so it's kind of ironic that I like uh, got to my um, atheism uh, because I like had to read during the day during my religious job. 
but like that's also kind of what got me um, involved in kind of libertarian politics. In some sense, I was already on the right in the sense that my parents were vaguely conservative, not like super active. Um, but yeah, my, my dad was the police chief of my hometown, kind of conservative-ish job. Um, he was of like an older generation where like you fastidiously don't talk about politics if you are in a public position of trust because you want everybody to see you as working for them. And so you don't want to politicize it. He, he, he like, wouldn't even talk about politics at the kitchen table. I mean, like it was like a real principled stand about like, this is like not something I'm involved in. Um, but you know, I think he's had conservative instincts. And then my mom was more, uh, political and she used to get Phyllis Schlafly's newsletter and, uh, and would be involved in Republican politics around the edges, but it wasn't a big thing. Um, in our lives. And then I had, you know, my best friend in, in junior high and high school was um, evangelical. And, you know, like his stepdad was running the local campaign for like Pat Robertson in 1988. And I like canvassed for Pat Robertson. Um, like, you know, so this was before I like, you know, was like reading Atlas Shrugged. So like, in some sense, I was already kind of on the right. I always thought Pat Robertson was nutty, uh, even when I was like, 15 or whenever it was uh you know i was my instincts at the time were like you know kind of like jack kemp kind of conservative um like so i liked markets but you know whatever the proto version of compassionate conservatism or whatever it was i became a hardcore libertarian ideologue after reading ayn rand and getting super into it um and it's interesting i mean like it like uh kind of relates to what we're talking about like so Ayn Rand is a lot like Ludwig von Mises. He's a big influence on her. Um, and she has a kind of a priori theory of morality, the defense of capitalism. Um, but it's not just um, a practical theory like von Mises, where he's like, here's why this is all going to work. Um, it's like a, a moral theory of why capitalism is the best. Um, but it's kind of spun out of first principles in a, in a similar way. Um, but it's even less, <laughs> it's kind of even less plausible when you start to get into um, moral questions. Uh, and, uh, but I, I experienced myself as really adopting that for the rational, like I accepted the rhetoric of rationality that was being offered as part of the evidence for the moral righteousness of free markets and unregulated capitalism. Like, like, it, it, like I accepted the idea that, that I had come upon this purely rationally um, rather than just like identifying with the ethos of it and like getting myself embedded in a community. Like I wouldn't have become like a, a, a Randian or an objectivist if, if, if it weren't for the internet. Right, like in the early days and when I was an undergrad, you know, and I got involved in internet discussion groups uh, on on like Usenet. I don't think people even know what that is anymore. Um, and uh, these kind of email lists. So I was on a email list about objectivism that was moderated by um, Jimmy Wales, the guy who started Wikipedia. Um, and uh, which is weirdly how I like I, I wrote a couple of the first articles on Wikipedia because I was involved with the objectivists who started it. Um, <laughs> but like uh, it was that community that I became involved in in college that kind of like really brought me into the to the ideology because then I, I otherwise I would have just kept reading other stuff and would have just drifted around with whatever I happened to be reading. And, you know, but like I made these friends on these discussion lists i like wanted to meet them so i like went to some meetings uh like these summer seminars and then like some of these people became really good friends and it kind of locks you in they're like okay this these are my people this is my tribe and this is what we think um and it's, it is fascinating some of my best friends are still people i met at objectivist conferences in the mid you know 1990s um they've yeah. moved on as well but like um, 
we were all coming from a similar place. We all had a kind of similar sensibility. So like, some, you know, I've got a good friend here in LA who uh, is an actor who I met at Objectivist Camp and got a good friend who's, you know, s several good friends who are like philosophy professors who I met at Objectivist Camp. And I love them to this day and they're great people. Um, are they still but, into know, it? <laughs> Um, no, I like, like, <laughs> like they are, they're all, um, some of them are more libertarian than others. Like, like one of the guys I met at one of those camps is like, uh, Matt Zwolinski, who's a professor at the university of San Diego. And he and I went through a very similar trajectory. He's, you know, he's, um, like he started this blog that was very influential for a few years, bleeding heart libertarians. And, you know, he started out a hardcore objectivist, you know, then just kind of like transitioned to the more general libertarian community, then started, you know, especially this something that happens if you go to grad school in philosophy, like he did and I did that, you know, you start getting good arguments against what you've been. Yeah. Thinking. Well, you start learning that what you had been told was objective. <laughs> it yeah. really isn't. Yeah, you start to see like other people who are as smart as you and as good at thinking, like mm -hmm. giving you really compelling objections that you're like, that can't be right. So you're spinning your wheels trying to figure out how to um, defend your beliefs, how to debunk the claims that they're making. And usually the only way you can do it, the only way you can manage it is by conceding something so that you can put yourself in a stronger position so you can save most of your position by giving up this little thing um but then it's an iterative process and you do it over and over again and after a while you've given up actually quite a lot of territory to save your view and then your view is like actually something that's different than what it is you started from and so like i think matt and i went through the same process we ended up a kind of like liberaltarian you like a sort of like um uh, you have sort of libertarian instincts about um, the virtues of markets, um, the virtues of of like free exchange, price systems, you know, like the way that they drive innovation and discovery, you, you know, committed as I still am today about like why economic growth is such a huge humanitarian good, how it leaves people a lot better off. Um, but like, OK, so like everything I used to think about redistribution is a little dicey. Um, and so like, you know, Matt is like one of the best academic exponents of, 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 uh, a universal basic income, like which he argues for on like Hayekian grounds, um, mm -hmm. which it, like, so it still has these libertarian influences, but like they're being kind of deployed to make a different argument. Uh, and, and that effectively like shifts you out of the the like organized political and social movement because you become a certain kind of heretic and it's like you can keep a foot in like depending on how much you're willing to like just sort of like and, and people do partly because these are it's all your friends. Their community yeah it's your community it's your people um and like in it and moving out of these communities is never easy um it's like it's isolating and alienating and and a lot of times you feel really wary of even if your mind has changed about what you think um i think a lot of times we carry with us like some vestigial i don't know animosity is the right word but like some sense of 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 dislike for the groups of people who were oh, that's tribalism basically. yeah yeah you don't get rid of the tribalism so you can you can you can convince yourself that okay my views about redistribution are wrong but like you spent so many years ragging on liberal democrats or something like that you kind of feel like awkward and hypocritical just like deciding to be like hang out with a bunch of liberal like these are my people now right because like a lot of the things that you thought about them weren't totally wrong either and so like you don't want to so you feel like you're selling out if you like suppress the, the things that you, you know, the, the critical things you think about that group of people um, that you still think are true. You feel like you're going to have to put that behind you to like really fit in. And you still want to feel like you've got some like integrity and that you're not going to just like 
sell out your beliefs just to fit in with another group of people. And so I think like that kind of process can leave you kind of like stranded in a kind of like social limbo where you've thought your way out of one community, but you haven't reconciled yourself with the implications of that enough to like feel comfortable joining a community one, that yeah. you'd previously seen as a bad influence on the world. Yeah. Well, now what about in regards to, um, Besides, you know, let's say incorrect understanding of of facts, um, there's also in libertarianism a, and in and, and far right conservatism, this sort of anti-democratic uh, viewpoint that's pretty heavily embedded, especially at the higher echelons. Um, I mean, that was something that, that you came into contact yourself uh, when you were the editor of, of Cato Unbound. Um, when, so Peter Till, the libertarian billionaire, um, he published an essay, and I, I get, and you were the editor of it. When which one of the things he said was that you know uh, I I am uh, afraid of the future of the free market because women have the right to vote, or that you know we were sort of that was a bad thing from the market standpoint, kind of. And then also, I'm worried that you know long term democracy and for the free market can't coexist. Um, is that a, is that a fair summary of his statement? Would you say? Yeah, totally. Um, uh, yeah. Now, what did you think when he when you saw that originally? Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you think it differently now. But like, what was uh, yeah, your... I mean, when I when he you know I commissioned this from him and I edited it. This was like in 2009, um, kind of before he was his, you know, he was much less famous then because he was less rich. Um. Um, but yeah, when I got this essay and it had the thing about like how um, the women's suffrage was uh, was like a big mistake, um, I like I disagreed with that strongly at the time. But my reaction was like, oh, this is going to get clicks. Uh, and it did. So like uh, I was right about that. But mostly I was excited about the fact that it was, you know, because like the Cato Unbound is a debate forum. And so when you're running a debate forum when somebody says something that other people are going to jump on it's just kind of good news uh so so that's how i felt about that but it's you know it's interesting it's followed him around it gets brought up a lot um and for and for good reason but like that is like a really um i mean for me that's i think one of the things biggest things that i was wrong about um but it's completely um common it's a common view in libertarian circles it's a common view in in uh conservative circles more broadly um for similar reasons but like often uh reasons that are more inflected with race and and uh you know gender hierarchy and stuff like that uh but like the libertarian version of it is just um the democracy is you know two wolves and a sheep voting on what to have for dinner, right? Like you hear people, they say that all the time. They love to say that. Um, and, you know, the idea is that if you just, if the way you run a society is just everybody gets to vote on what happens, then you're going to have majorities who are, who are just going to vote themselves goodies out of the pockets of the productive, innovative, you know, Promethean creators. Um, and that is just like a danger to the development of um, technology, wealth, uh, growth, you know, like our life, I and mean, we're going to live, we're going to be less healthy, we're going to live less long, because we're just going and, and to be voting a, away the capital that's developing yeah. the things that are making our lives better. Yeah, and it's not a Trumpian perspective at all. Like, I, I think some progressives who kind of came into politics recently have all these ideas that Donald Trump, you know, personally corrupted a lot of people on the right, but, you know... These are views that have been out there for a long time. I mean, Mitt Romney's, you know, 2012 presidential campaign. Um, and Paul Ryan was out there regularly talking about makers versus takers. Um, and so, you know, it's... Paul Ryan was a, you know... A hardcore Ayn Rand. Yeah, he's a, yeah. he got it from Ayn Rand. Um, you know, Mitt Romney certainly didn't, but like that's just part of the kind of Chamber of Commerce right is like... Yeah, like we we don't we don't want majorities feeling like they can just vote away our profits our um, yeah. or vote away our uh, you know, like our business models. 
Um, and so like, yeah, so that, that's been persistent. And, and it, you've, you've got those two strands, like you've got the kind of libertarian strand on the right, you've got kind of the, just sort of the, the business strand, just rich people who don't want to be taxed. Um, this is a good, you know, they like this argument for restraining uh, majoritarian institutions because they think it, it endangers their wealth. Um, and then you get this other strand out of, you know, like the reorganization of party lines after the Civil Rights Act, right? Like the, you know, Southern white conservatives um, were always anti-democratic in the sense that they like certainly didn't want there to be equal uh, voting rights for all of the residents of their states, right? Like they, because they were defending a system of, of, of white supremacy and, you know, very vigorously <laughs> trying to trying to keep it in place. And, and so like majoritarian democracy is just completely, was always completely anathema to, um, yeah. to this. Well, and, then, and then they are also against it from a religious standpoint as well, because, you know, if everybody has the same religious liberty, then that means that, <clears throat> you know, that means that people who are Jewish have a right to have a menorah in a public square, just as Christians can put a Christmas tree there, or it means, you know, that Hindus can have a thing there or atheists. Um, and and we can't have that you know these people non-christians deserve fewer rights like this is actually something they will even say explicitly sometimes um they don't they can't say that in public so yeah. much anymore with race but they do say that with respect we are a religion. christian nation yeah. and it's our right to defend christian supremacy yeah yeah um and yeah and so so in a lot of ways the anti-democracy on the right is sort of overdetermined there's all these different reasons um and my like you know antipathy to democracy or at least just kind of coolness toward it was in that in that kind of two wolves and a sheep you know voting for what to have for dinner and and it like and it's just like a fundamentally mistaken view empirically like it's not not even just like morally misguided it's that you know like you can talk about you know people have rights you can just, you know, libertarians are big on people having rights, but like systems don't just like recognize your rights. They don't just like automatically see everybody as being an equal participant in the political system and the way people get their rights recognized and protected historically has been through the expansion of democratic participation. And so just like the story of of like freedom is largely a story of, of, uh, of, you know, the next group that's been marginalized campaigning, uh, and making enough trouble that sooner or later they're brought into the political system so that they stop making so much noise and creating so many problems. And once they're brought into the system, they use the system to get their rights recognized and protected. And that happens in waves and waves and waves. And it happens, especially when you're in a system where um, markets are effective and you're getting a high level of economic growth because, you know, you might have a, a, an elite that dominates, but if the economy is productive, you're getting a lot of growth. Some of it trickles down, in fact. And then the next group down that's not adequately represented, they once they have more resources, that gives them more heft in the system they deploy it and basically say like nice system you have here feudal lords like would be terrible if something happened to it and then the feudal lords are like okay you can you can be in parliament or whatever and and then that's actually good for the system because protecting those people's rights and acknowledging them and protecting them releases a lot of their productive and innovative energies that makes the system grow more the next group down in the hierarchy gets a little more power and heft and they ask for the same thing. And you get this kind of cascading effect of democratization through yeah. growth. Um, and so like, it's just like, it's, it's a kind of backwards, <laughs> like to, to actually think that, uh, that democracy is a threat to this stuff because like growth kind of creates, um, you know, like historically has helped create democratization and democratization um, protects their growth by like releasing all these productive energies 
Yeah. Um, and that's kind of where, where I am now. Like, I think it's just like absolutely egregious that like people are still trying to stop people from fully participating in the system because I really think that they're just like shooting themselves in the foot. Like we have so much, uh, you know, like Republicans are, you know, have gone through all of these voting reform, you know, voting reform, um, you know, oh, implemented yeah. all these measures in all these Republican majority states um, to make it harder for Democrats, um, especially in states where there's a high African-American population to like try to keep them from fully participating. Um, but that's where like most of our like unreleased potential is like, um, I don't know, this is a tangent. I just like watched that movie King Richard um, about Richard Williams, the Venus and Serena Williams, dad who like coached them to be tennis pros uh, from, you know, when they were like little girls and that movie was just making me think just like, you know, here's this like one kind of insane person who like was maniacally driven to juice every bit of like potential out of his like daughters and like succeeded. Um, and you see like their level of success, like they're the best like tennis players who've ever lived. And you're just like, you know, but they're from kind of Compton. You're just like, how much other incredible potential is there that's just been completely stifled by the fact that the schools are shitty um, and they can't vote themselves better funding for the schools because like the Republicans in their state are just keeping them from getting representation in the state house. You know, like it's like and so like uh, and so you, you have this process where the side that's actually like um, is 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 stifling innovation and growth is the side that's trying to prevent people from participating fully because if they could participate fully they would use the system to make sure that they had adequate opportunity and that would be good for everybody yeah well so i mean no i i, I think that's true and one thing that i've noticed um is that so you know you you and i have known each other you know for what i guess probably about 20 years roughly on and off right yeah. um a lot of people that you know we both worked with or knew socially in dc you know right-wing circles um have left that world um and it's something that you know I'll, I'll probably have to write something about it but there's just this real massive brain drain uh among conservatives and it, it, it was taking place before trump uh but definitely got accelerated after him i mean would you agree with that yeah, I mean, like, for sure, like it, I mean, like, as I think you've written a lot about the kind of Republican Party, the conservative movement has really been more and more taken over by this kind of Christian nationalist faction that is um, crazy, <laughs> but they're, they're like dogmatic and they don't care about the facts. Uh, they're kind of actively hostile to anything that just doesn't align with their dogma. And so people with just like a, you know, you might have a conservative sensibility, but if you have even a mildly responsible, you know, set of, um, you know, you know, epistemic practices, like if you're, if you're like, well, I should really weigh the evidence, look at both sides or whatever, like you're not going to last. Um, because like these days, it's not about having a considered position. Um, it's about posturing and an identity like, and yeah and just like signaling your affiliation with this tribe and like it doesn't and like the crazy thing about like conservatism these days is that like what it means to signal solidarity with your group is constantly changing and constantly getting crazier um and so if it's like crazy QAnon stuff about like child sex trafficking or like you know adrenochrome or you know like hillary clinton eating babies like like that's what you got to say like maybe next week you don't have to say that anymore and it's a new thing about like how critical race theory is um you know a new form of communism stocking the land and it's all just nuts but like that doesn't matter right like and it gets to the you know all the the epistemology of the right like there is no, there's no it's not a set of beliefs that's based in anything now other than 
Well, and, and they're not even based on policies either. So like, you know, for the longest time, you know, you're supposed to be anti-tariff. You were supposed to be pro-immigration. Uh, you know, you were supposed to, uh, you know, believe in this, you know, uh, creative destruction economically and, uh, you know, like tell people to just move away if they had, you know, if their neighborhood was bad, they should just leave. Um, mm -hmm. And it, and and these things have all you know depart or or big be a big China booster, uh, in manufacturing and outsourcing. Like these were all things that you were supposed to believe as a as a loyal Republican or Libertarian, um, and those things just went out the window. Uh, and it's like you know every couple of months something that they had considered a core principle just gets thrown out. Um, and you know it's so I see that. And, you know, a lot of people that, that we both know and have, have, have moved away from that. But at the same time, there do seem to be people out there like Chris Christie or Mike Pence or some of these other, you know, people who, who are basically trying to say, well, I think that this thing can be saved. Uh, you know, I'm not anti-Trump. I just, I just don't like some of the things he does sometimes. Um, I mean, but no one, there's no audience for that. I don't think they realize that. No, I mean, like, that's the problem. And this, and this gets to, um, you know, just like the relationship between um, uh, kind of epistemic nihilism and authoritarianism, right? Like, there's, um, you know, like, what we believe is already mostly based on trust, like, as we were talking about, uh, talking about earlier. Um, and this is part of the reason why, like, we're getting these increasing division on education, uh, but it's not all on trust, right? Like part of the system of education that we have is teaching people um, how to think, how to think critically, like what the scientific method is, like how you actually can successfully establish facts about the world, or at least figure out what the most probable state of the world is, you know, like, you know, you don't have to be certain about things, but like, what's probably true, right? Like, and like, so we learn, you know, we learn some sciences, we learn statistics, we learn probability theory, we learn, like, how to detect how to recognize when somebody's doing it right. And so that you can see that they're the kind of person that you should trust. Um, because they're using the methods that you would use if you were sincerely trying to get at the truth about reality. Uh, and that's what you learn when you go to college, you know, like you like people learn it better or worse, but, you, but part of going to college is also part of just like becoming enculturated to an ethos that respects this kind of set of practices around figuring out what to believe. Well, um, that believes that knowledge is possible <laughs> basically. Yeah. And, the, and, the, and that like, there's a way to, there's a way to get it. Like, cause like, if you like, like, especially if you go to grad school in anything, like a lot of it is about the method that you're going to use. Um, and so you learn respect for methods. Um, like, and, and so over time, like the more the right has sort of just drifted off into uh, a kind of nihilistic dogmatism, like, people with any college education had just been like fleeing like crazy because it's so contrary to the ethos that their social class and peer group have been enculturated to through higher education. Um, the people who haven't gone to college are the most prone to just authoritarian rhetoric uh, because like when you don't have a way of like, okay, there's a dispute. I have to figure out, like, I'm not going to really get to the bottom of it, right? Because I don't have, like, I don't know enough. Uh, but like, I have to figure out who to trust in the dispute, right? So like, I'm, I'm going to look at people on one side and people on the other side, um, and like, how how do I know what to tr who to trust? Um, and it's easy for me as like an overeducated person with like you know more than one graduate degree to like have a sense of like what kind of people are just freelancing and bullshitting and what kind of people who are are like actually um like if it's 
COVID stuff, right? Like I know what it looks like when somebody does, uh, uh, you know, good empirical statistical analysis of the success of a vaccine or something like that. I, I can't do the math myself, but I know what yeah. it looks like. And, and you, I know, you know what knowledge looks like. That's really yeah. what it is. And, and so like, if I see, so if I see, I saw in the morning, you know, the Dean of the Brown School of Public Health, Ashish Jha, who I worked with on some COVID policy stuff when I was in Niskanen. I know that that guy knows what he's talking about. I trust that the Dean of the Brown University School of Public Health um, knows how to think about public health and epidemiology in the right kind of way. Um, but like, it's because like, I was trained in the institutions that he's a part of people who don't like, as far as they're concerned, what he's saying, it might as well be just an argument from authority, right? Like they don't have any way of recognizing that his method of investigation or discourse is any more valid than anybody else's, right? So if you have somebody else on the other side, just claiming authority um, and possessing a kind of assured charisma that projects confidence and authority, um, they're able to use that, that, that charismatic authority to undermine the legitimacy of the people who are doing it right. Fake news, whatever, right? Like, um, then you can like, just get people to believe you, whatever you say, right? Because like, once you've got them in, once you've roped them into your net, um, and they trust you enough to, you know, acknowledge and basically cede certain, if they cede epistemic authority to you at all, then you can use that as a wedge to cut them off from people who ought to have epistemic authority, right? And, that, and that's what's happened, right? Like, so like Trump has like, is so good at the charismatic authority game and he's brought so many people in and then he's used their deference to his judgment to cut them off from all the mainstream media sources, to cut them off from any scientific inquiry that is inconvenient for him politically or personally, from any legal inquiry that's inconvenient for him, yeah. right? Like, and so like he's effectively built a bubble that he's trapped almost Millions half the population people. in. Yeah, uh, and well, and there's and 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 once you're in that bubble. Right. Like, and, and I've seen this in these like accounts of like my, my sister got into QAnon and won't talk to me anymore because I vote for Joe Biden, who she thinks is a child rapist. Right. Like, like I can't, and, and like, but, and how do I get her out of there? Like, you just can't in, in like in a, in a easy way because, um, like, what can you say? Right. Like, if she's decided that you're on the side of the child rapists, that anything that you can show her from the newspaper is fake that like anything that science says is like fake, right? Like the only people she's going to believe are people on her like QAnon message board and Donald Trump, then like, there's no way in. Yeah. Um, and and I think well, that's part of the problem that like Chris Christie's are running into is that like, is that because, because now all that whole group of people, their set of beliefs is, is fixed by nothing, but charismatic authority. Um, <laughs> That like, that either you are aligned with that authority or you're not. And that's the only question. Um, and that's, I think, one of the main reasons why, uh, you know, a lot of people were hoping that Republicans after, you know, losing, uh, you know, losing their Senate majority um, and losing the White House, that they would start coming to their senses. Um, but so many people are so trapped like that that people are in a position where they don't know how to operate unless it's inside the scope of like what Trump agrees with or doesn't agree with right yeah. because like they have no but, way to navigate the world outside of the judgments of that authority that they've uh, yeah. kind of seeded their belief formation to now but how many people do you think though on the let's say the in the democratic elites or their big donors you know, progressive media personalities. I don't think that they understand that this is a epistemic problem here. They seem to think of it mostly as just a partisan thing. Do you think that's right? 
In other words, like I don't see a lot of concern about because basically, effectively, our society is, has allowed the construction of a parallel anti-epistemology. Um, and the people who have been so busy building, you know, let's say building the ivory tower, if you will, they had no idea, they weren't paying attention to what was happening outside their activities. And then now that they're, you know, vaguely aware of it because, you know, <laughs> they tried to, to overthrow democracy on January 6th, um, they still don't understand why they did it um, and how to try to get people interested and move them away from this, you know, nihilism. I don't think they get it. Do you? You know, I, I think it's, a, I think it's a mixed bag. Um, I, I think a, a lot of them get it. Um, but like, you know, and then it's there, not about Trump. That's the there's thing, a lot like, of political consultants, I think who like are, um, who are like stuck in, what is effectively an outdated model of how to think about public opinion because they just think that like, well, you're going to be able to pretty easily bring enough people in the middle toward your side by like, you know, making the right kind of concession or reframing an issue or talking about it a little bit differently. Um, and, and like, but like if the issue is just sort of like, um, are you with us or against us? Um, are you one of the liars or one of the truth tellers, right? You can't be a liar who's suddenly more attractive, right? Like it's, and, 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 the, and there's like, there's this assumption that it's just going to work as it normally works. Um, and I, and I just don't think that's true. I think, so, I think there are a lot of Democrat elites who do get that, um, that it is this kind of epistemological problem that, that, that you have this, a very large set of people who have between you know, Trump himself and all the auxiliary institutions like Fox News and OAN and Newsmax and the Federalist and whatever, who are like feeding this, um, who are, you know, kind of consolidating um, this kind of like fever dream right wing uh, dogma. Uh, I think, I think people see that like, that it's kind of hard to penetrate that. Um, and, and, but I think people are just kind of buzz like I am, like, I'm just kind of baffled. Uh, I, like, what do you do about it? It's, it's because it is just so hard to get a wedge in. Um, and you like now, like, I think it's easy to over, um, to oversell how many people on the right are like deep into any of this. Cause most people don't pay that much attention to politics. Uh, and so, there are a lot of people on the right who are not so informed are kind of in the middle. They are persuadable. Um, and a lot, and, and there's a lot of it uh, there. And, and I do think there's a, a fair number of people who, who like, you know, are just kind of dispositionally conservative. Um, they, uh, you know, they worry about critical race theory in the schools or whatever. Uh, like it's become an issue it must be valid because it's come up and uh but like if you could actually get through to them to tell to like communicate clearly what's going on they'd be like oh i don't want anything to do with that um but part of the problem is, is it's still just like hard to communicate to those people um and, and, and but i do think i do think there's a fair number of people that are reachable you know it's, it's in it which is how democrats won the last time around um but it's like it's just like a really hard it's it's a really hard problem. Um, like you need this kind of deprogramming. Um, and like and like I actually kind of think that the problem isn't really going to get solved until uh, Trump goes away, um, and that that leads to just like the fragmentation of authority. Um, it's like when Joseph Smith gets murdered. Um, like when you have when your whole belief system is is based in charismatic authority um, and and that guy goes away, a bunch of people are going to try to claim it and it's not going to, you know, it's unlikely that somebody concedes in consolidating the same allegiance that, you know, that Trump had. So like, you know, if Trump ends up in prison or ends up, uh, you know, uh, 
having a coronary and dropping off the face of the earth, um, I think things could like improve pretty rapidly. Um, but as long as he's in there trying, trying to maintain his grip, um, I think it's going to, he's succeeding his grip. Like it's weird. Like he's not on Twitter. He's not on Facebook. Um, he's kind of in the background. Um, but like, you're still fucked if you're on, not on his side in a Republican tri- primary. Yeah. Um, well, and um, I guess, and yeah, no, this, is, this has been great. I, and I agree with that, but I guess last, last question is, so we have seen also that, you know, besides the fact that a bunch of people who were on the political right have migrated away from it, um, there have been a smaller number of people who were at least, let's say, identified on the left. Um, let's say, like uh, the YouTuber Dave Rubin, or um, um, I don't know, like that Tim Pool guy. Um, like they basically have have started trying to cultivate a, a right wing audience, and in some cases are saying that they're conservative themselves. Um, and uh, but. Is it fair to say, though, that these people, the one thing they all have in common is that they're not very smart? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, or is that my own bias talking? What do you think? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, it's like what I'm saying that like Trump is a, a certain kind of genius. It depends on like, you know, what sense of smart you mean. Like, clearly, like if you're trying to like cultivate an audience, it's smart because, uh, you know, it's easy. Um, uh you know, like telling people know, if we all just right. went Marjorie yeah. Taylor Greene and Lauren mm-hmm. Boebert or whatever, like, uh, you know, like it's, it's easy to get people uh, uh, to, to click. But yeah, I mean, like, I mean, what I think they have in common is, is, um, is, um, I don't know, like sympathy for uh in egalitarian views about race and gender uh, that, you know, that whole group of people seems to think it's just kind of like exhausting and annoying that people won't stop talking about, you know, like standing up for you know, the police killing black people or like, like just like uh, identity politics sigh, right? Like in, and so like the attempt, so the sympathy with, the idea that there's nothing really valid in in claims that um, that non-white people and women haven't achieved full equality in our society, like, and that just being like, we got to, you know, and some of those people, like, like there are people like way on the left who, you know, they think that the key to politics is is making the working class coalesce. Um, and they just see identity politics as a huge political problem because, um, uh, a lot of the white working class people are, are racist. And if you keep telling them they're racist, they're not going to get together with the black working class and you need the black working class and the white working class to congeal for workers and working class to have power. And so like the left needs to shut up about the woke stuff. Um, because like the woke stuff is just a way of dividing the working class. Um, and uh, like, there's something to that. Um, and, and I, and I think some, some of the people, uh, some like, like, you know, kind of the, in the kind of vaguely like Glenn, Glenn Greenwald kind of area can start with that kind of view nice. and then end up getting pulled into the community and way more sympathetic with the nutty stuff than they otherwise would have been. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when and I guess, uh, yeah, you, you you mentioned the idea of identity politics. I mean, ultimately, American right wing politics is entirely based on identity. Like yeah. everything about it is is white Christian identity. Like that's what it is. Um, and so there's it's just like this really interesting, fascinating kind of jujitsu act there to uh, to take something that is you know, to point that, but to, you know, point out their own, like, thing that they built on and then projected on to, uh, to other people. Uh, it's just yeah. amazing. Yeah, the form <laughs> white Christian identity politics takes is just total umbrage at the idea that they're involved in any sort of identity politics. Yeah, they can't. Right, they like, can't that see identity it. politics is bad. 
And that's what everybody but us is doing. Yeah. That's essentially how it is. Yeah. And, you know, and, and they have managed to, and that's been persuasive to, you know, a small number of, let's say, leftish white people, basically. Um, I don't see a lot of uh, women going that route. So it seems to be mostly men. But um, but then again, I guess, yeah, there aren't a lot of libertarian women out there either. <laughs> no, I mean, and, and, and for like, you know, it, it's what, like, here's an identity politics you know, observation is that, which people just ought to give more credence. Like that if, that if a certain view is almost wholly occupied by people of a certain identity, then that position is about that identity. And, and like, like, <laughs> like you might not see it, you might be kind of oblivious to it, but if it's something that only is like, white guys of a certain social class think then they've got a pol they're, that politics is about that identity like if you've got a politics that's like genuinely like multicultural and multi-class and all this stuff like that like it's not about all those identities because they're all coming together to do something together they agree on yeah um and and, and but yeah, if, if if it's just like if you've got a movement that's dominated by white Christians, um, then it's about white Christian identity. It, like there's just not, not a way around it. But that's exactly what um, all the bitching and screaming is about, is about like not allowing, trying to make it so that it's it's not a valid opinion to voice in public that like that's all they are about. Um, and, and like it, so I think that, you know, fundamentally anti-identity politics, anti-wokeness politics is a defensive measure to prevent clarity of thought about the monomaniacal focus of the right on its own identity politics. Yeah. All right. Well, that, that's, that's great. I, I think that's a great point. Um, all right. Well, this has been a great discussion and I hope everybody's enjoyed it. Um, so I've been talking with Will Wilkinson. He's the publisher of Model Citizen. Model Citizen is a Substack newsletter, so be sure to subscribe to that. Um, and then he is Will Wilkinson. That's W-I-L-K-I-N-S-O-N on Twitter. So thanks for being here today, Will. Thanks so much, Matt. It was a, uh, a pleasure, as always. Uh, all right. Um, all right. Well, so um, just a little bit of housekeeping here. I wanted to remind everybody that Theory of Change is part of the Flux community. It's a new media uh, organization for podcasters and writers where we bring together people with uh, perspectives that aren't often seen in the mainstream media. So the address for that is flux.community. So please check that out. And that's also where the Theory of Change show archives are at. Uh, but you can go right to it also by going to theoryofchange.show. Uh, and if you like what we're doing here, please go to patreon.com slash discoverflux. So thank you for being here today, everyone. And I will see you next week.